So let's wait for everybody to show up. So I guess uh, this was Eva's idea to have uh, this like a round table discussion with maybe like some questions that were raised during the meeting um, and, you know, kind of get the input from uh, everybody on, um, you know, kind of for some of these like longer term plannings, like are there some like uh, uh, things that we want to discuss on like potential directions in which this Vani ecosystem is going? Um, and we kind of had some questions. Um, so one was the question of the like symmetry. Um, so the question was why do Vanya functions in the uh, max uh, localized scheme, why do they break symmetry? Um, and it looks like there are some ways to kind of improve on this. We had some talks. Uh, and then, you know, we had many other questions. Um, so there was a question of, is there anything that could be gained for from non-orthonormality of the uh, Vanya functions if they are not uh, orthonormal. Uh, then on Monday and Tuesday in the summer school, there was a question of descriptors. Uh, so I think after my, uh, Nicola's talk, Rafael's talk, there was this question of, um, you know, can we get some meaningful descriptors out of Vanya functions? Uh, and how do we deal with this choice of gauge in that case? Um, or is, is that even a problem? Uh, and then I think Rafael had this comment that like a lot of the chemical intuition all of the chemical concepts are not really like maybe strictly formally mathematically well defined and seems to work just fine. Then we had questions about uh, this idea of when you compute the position matrix element of diagonal and diagonal and then the, in the diagonal case you use the logarithm formula, then how do you and then you know that for the off diagonal you don't so then you know is there some way to fix those. Um, uh, there are certain problems with translation variants that appear. Anyway, so there are a lot of questions. So uh, um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to um, start uh, by giving some comments on this or maybe raise some other questions, uh, please do. So I, I, yeah, I think this works, no? Yes. I think we should also keep it as an informal conversation. So maybe we go through these topics uh, and also David can hear and is unmuted. Uh, probably there should be one more microphone uh, around uh, so that people can feel uh, and comment. Huh? Um, but maybe we can start with the symmetry, David. What do you think? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, there is the possibility that you hear two very different opinions. Huh? <laughs> so I'll give uh, uh, David uh, the, the chance to have the last word. Uh, that's usually it is the last, uh, uh, it is the last uh, word. Uh, uh, but, you know, I would even go back uh, for a moment uh, to molecules rather than solids. Uh, you know, if you think at molecules, uh, uh, you can have different localization criteria. You can have the foster boys criterion, that is the R squared minus R squared. Or you can have the edmonston rudenberg criterion that you maximize the Coulombic self-interaction. Uh, and you get uh, not only very different symmetries, uh, in the orbitals, but also very different chemical intuition that if you want is a negative statement about the fact that there is, in my opinion, actually no symmetry that natural, naturally comes from localization or no chemical intuition that, you know, naturally means that say formally comes. So then there is a lot of heuristic understanding, but uh, I think uh, we made uh, the case of CO2 last week, uh, uh, where a CO2 uh, localized the uh, Foster boys or localized Edmiston Rudenberg give rise to completely different orbitals. Uh, you can have, you know, something that looks like a triple bond with Foster boys that doesn't make any sense. Uh, in uh, molecules like, uh, you know, ethylene, CH4, H2, you get the banana bonds so that the chemistry don't look like, don't like. So even in molecules, uh, uh, you know, you don't have uh, a you know, special, unique, uh, universal, physically meaningful representation, and even more so in solids, uh, because now you're not only mixing uh, at a K point uh, that would have been gamma, uh, but you are uh, then integrating uh, all over the zone. But I, David, I don't know what you think on this. Uh, uh, well, um, I guess I would start at a a slightly more elementary level. I mean, we, we certainly know lots of cases where 
um, the symmetry will get spontaneously broken by the maximal localization. I mean, the simplest case is just a closed shell atom with S and P orbitals. If you start out with S projections and PX, PY, and PZ projections, you're going to minimize to SP3 hybrids. Um, you know, as we know for finite systems, the minimization basically just tries to push the centers as far apart as possible. And so, um, uh, so certainly that's a case uh, where you break symmetry. Um, I think it might be useful to distinguish two different kinds of broken symmetry. There are situations where, uh, I mean, let's suppose you just had a one dimensional uh, S orbital and PX orbital, you know, uh, and then they break symmetry to, to form a, an X hi a PX hybrid and a PY hybrid. Um, if the two hybrids, if the two 1A functions still map onto each other under the symmetry operation, then, you know, it will still produce a perfectly symmetric representation when you do 1A interpolation and so on. Um, so that's still acceptable, although you have to understand that you're not quite dealing with atomic orbitals uh, as you put them into the projectors. Uh, and then there are cases where it's just going to break symmetry in some kind of random way and scramble things. And that's, I think, what we <laughs> want to be more careful to avoid. So that's my initial comment. Anything from the audience? Hi, Raffaele. I don't know if your camera works, but you are super welcome also to. Uh, what do people in the audience think? Or, you know, I think maybe the question is also, when is symmetry very relevant? And uh, I think uh, all the people building uh, low energy Hamiltonians care a lot about symmetry. Uh, as you know, I'm obsessed uh, with Koopman's functional and orbital density dependent functional. But again, there, you know, we have actually, uh, if you want an intellectual failure, that uh, it's not evident uh, that the spectrum of an uh, orbital density dependent Hamiltonian has the symmetry properties that the spectrum of a real Hamiltonian should have. So in some ways, is also related to some of these other developments. So, Part of the question actually was even just practical. Like uh, uh, why, okay, so why didn't you uh, implement to begin with many 90 using symmetry? That is, uh, instead of uh, summing over all the K vectors in the Brillouin zone, oh. just using the irreducible yeah, part. I, I can take that question uh, that has a very deep answer. And uh, it's the fact that uh, uh, I knew the code that I was using, uh, that was a derivative of CASTEP, sort of what we call the old bands ensemble DFT code. So it was uh, calculating gradients uh, with respect to everything. And somehow uh, CASTEP uh, was built, uh, you know, along the goals of doing uh, large scale simulations. So, you know, maybe in the limit of gamma sampling only, but still with K points like the Carparinello code that was developed here in Trieste actually had gamma sampling only. Uh, while the PWSCF code was built uh, with symmetry from the very beginning. But I would say it's just random. I mean, the code uh, that uh, I was using uh, was, uh, was built uh, without symmetry. Uh, and I think we discussed at the beginning uh, because uh, David uh, with Dominic King Smith and others had developed, you know, the first ultra soft uh, pseudo potential code, uh, rightly so. But we said that maybe it's better to start non conserving, it might be a bit easier. And that was absolutely true, actually. So, and so, so that's it, just by chance. I think yeah. that we had a time reversal just for simplicity, but I don't know. David? Um, I mean, the other thing just historically is that, you know, the attitude was that the computer time to do the maximal localization was going to be trivial compared to the computer time to do the DFT calculation. And so we just weren't worried about it. Uh, from the point of view of computer time, of course, maybe we should have been worried about it from the point of view of preserving symmetry, but um, it was sort of too early days for us to worry about that, I guess. Uh, just as a side note, you know, some of the interesting thing about breaking symmetry uh, that is actually a numerical 
broken symmetry is that when we were first doing calculations, say with silicon or gallium arsenide, and uh, if you were to do a Monkost pack mesh that was unshifted, uh, containing gamma, everything was symmetric, but if you would do the shifted mesh, you would actually have a numerical uh, breaking of the symmetry with a one vanier function having a center and a spread that was slightly different from the other. And I think David explained me to me why that was, and I sort of keep trying to remind myself why that was, but I remember the phenomenology of this. Good but, but so, so if I do a calculation in, um, so, you know, like if I could plot uh, spread as a function of all of the degrees of freedom in the gauge, which is, you know, a huge number of dimensions. If you have 10 by 10 bands with 500 K points, that's like 10 by 10 by 500 degrees of freedom. In that space, you know, I could have a situation where, you know, uh, so this is my gauge space. And, 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 and this is my uh, spread. And so maybe there's some point at which, you know, a gauge is symmetric, but then there's some choice of matrices where the gauge is not symmetric. I could, so are we in a situation that, um, you know, we are like this or like this, you know? So both of these cases, the gauge is symmetric, um, but the minimum, you know, in one case is over here. So are we in the situation that when Vanier functions break the symmetry, then, you know, we actually have two choices for very similar gauges with the same spread, but then the code just picks one of them. Or are we kind of guaranteed somehow to be in the situation that the maximum localized gauge is going to be the one, like, you know, the one that does pres preserve the symmetry. Because if we somehow, this whole gauge space has so many degrees of freedom that we kind of don't yeah. think about how does the spread look like as a function of degrees of freedom in the gauge space. And, you know, I remember also this, so in the 1997 paper, you guys mentioned magnesium oxide, where apparently if you put oxygen orbital on, uh, Oxygen, uh, P orbital on the oxygen that whichever way you're oriented, you always got the same spread. So that means that basically in that landscape of gauges, yeah. your spread was basically like very flat, right? Yeah. So, you know, your uh, spread as a function of gauge, you know, you could have picked, you know, infinitely yeah. many points yeah. that all have the same. Yeah. That, that happens a lot uh, in, uh, uh, especially things like uh, manganese oxide and nickel oxide, the 3D in an oxide. Uh, but I think you said it was like 10 to the minus 12, like or 10 or something, yeah. like many, many, many digits. So even if it's yeah. ionic, yeah. shouldn't there be like a little variation somehow in there that, you know, like P orbitals want to point along the X axis and Y and Z and not like in some random. But you have also all the numerical, not noise, but imprecision in the finite differences, uh, you know, in your representation of the position operator and so on. So in the, um, so I, I think there are actually two questions, maybe that yeah. we separate. And sorry, if we go back to the first, uh, I mean, I would also imagine, you know, we are using R square, but we could use R fourth, uh, and all of a sudden you switch a different physics that yeah. could make you swap from one to the other. So, but let's say you pick one. Let's say you pick. Well, us. but I don't. So there isn't, uh, you know, I mean, so it's accidental that you are in the double well versus the single well situation depending on the chemistry of the system and the localization functional that you have defined. So again, maybe I'm too generic, but I don't see anything that should say we should always be in the top case with a single well or so on. I don't um, know. Let me um, say one other thing. Um, uh, uh, I think Sinisha's question was, was, was getting at the question of whether sometimes it's exactly flat. Um, and I think sometimes it is exactly flat in, in some sense. So for example, suppose you had some, um, some atom with P, Px, Py, and Pz orbitals, and it's in a cubic crystal field. So maybe there are hydrogen atoms in the plus and minus x, plus and minus y, and plus and minus z directions, you know, symmetrically disposed around it. And then, you know, you ask, you know, are the maximally localized 1A functions going to be the px, py, and pz, or uh, how about um, uh, px plus py over root two, px minus py over root two, and pz? And um, and so <clears throat> you can rotate the 1A functions by some angle theta, 
And uh, I think you can prove that the spread functional uh, has no higher harmonics than like cosine of two theta or something. And in the cubic crystal field, you can't have anything uh, uh, below, uh, you know, um, cosine uh, of four theta, and therefore it has to be exactly flat. So I think there are cases like that where it is exactly flat. And I think that even follows over to the, to the crystal environment, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, magnesium oxide or something like that. Um, oh, so, yeah. so, so if it's exactly flat, that means that unless you start from a high symmetry point, you're almost guaranteed to end up in a low symmetry state. Yeah. In that case, right? Yeah. But again, you swap uh, from square to fourth and it's not flat anymore. It's almost flat, you know? Mm. But, uh, but I see. E exactly because of this, uh, um, you know, when we did the manganese oxide, uh, we were co diagonalizing our square. Uh, in order, because exactly you would end up in anything that was random, basically, and uh, and so we decided that you know we had the five D when your functions mixed together, and we would co-diagonalize in that space uh, R square. Okay. Yes. So that, just a comment. If you go to, to the sec, if you go to the second image uh, where we have the more parabolic picture, more symmetric minimum, and the double minimum in the Mexican act. So I also have the feeling that uh, according to the way you minimize, you can get e either solutions. Uh, and uh, so the one thing I have in mind is something like, uh, if I minimize, I don't know, copper with six Vanier functions, I may obtain something. If I minimize it with seven Vanier functions, uh, I may need to break the symmetry to, to, to get in something that is more localized. Perhaps one interesting question there could be under which conditions one get the symmetric uh, minima, if any, or, or what, what is the physics? So somehow the, the, where we have the broken symmetry thing, it looks like a more frustrated situation. And I don't know. So th th this is just and waving and, uh, and feeling but, like. Uh, and again, I don't know if it's my opinion, but you could. Uh, have an isotropic expansion or contraction of the system. So you don't change any symmetry, but R square changes. And I would imagine that you can swap between this situation just by tuning this global handle. And that's why I sort of, uh, I tend to be a bit pessimistic or whatever, I'm not over interpreting. But I think this question of like, if you have six and then make seven, you know, the thing is that, you know, like if you have five, the orbit, you know, you know each 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 represent you know each uh, representation of the point group or space group has a certain number of degeneracies right so you know they have to be five d states to have the full symmetry if you have four then you kind of naturally so i think probably as you kind of add more and more you know you're kind of filling up something that exactly has the number of degeneracies in the representation for that group right so i think if then if you're in a situation that you know you needed a two dimensional representation but you only added one more state then maybe you naturally will break it. But then with another one, maybe you won't. But I would also separate the you know, composite separate bands of an insulator as a problem and the disentangled yeah. of the metal where I yes. think everything, yeah. Uh, metal is, yeah. everything goes. Yeah. Yeah. Something else people want to add? Um, I wanted to to maybe pick uh, your brain on uh, a question that was raised in one of the flash talks, which is that uh, uh, I forget who it was, but he was doing supercell calculations on a pristine uh, system with a smaller primitive cell periodicity. Uh, and uh, he found that the maximum localized Vani functions broke that uh, primitive cell uh, periodicity. And uh, well, so the, the question is, I guess that has to be numerical. And uh, one possibility that came up in the discussions is that this might be related to the lack of size consistency of the discretization of the derivative. So there is this work by Stengel and Spalding where they solve that problem. Yeah. So I'm just 
I guess. So what we are saying is opinions. that uh, we take silicon in the primitive cell and we get something with the silicon in a super cell and we could have a symmetry breaking. Yeah, so the Vani functions in the supercell are not exact replicas of one another. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, so there are two possibilities that come to mind. One that I find it very physically interesting that is, but maybe it's not the one that you want to discuss, that is uh, uh, when the system uh, would have uh, a charge transfer uh, instability. So. In general, in a supercell, you could also have a, an electronic state that breaks the symmetry of the so primitive physics, cell, and that's yeah. one thing. But let's suppose that that is not the case. Again, gut feeling is that this would be possible. I mean, in principle, the only thing that comes out all the time is that maybe you know you get the px orbitals and they have swapped signs or things like this or the d orbitals that are mixed uh, would be mixed in different ways at every site. Now it's true, but maybe it's good to have David on this. I mean, it, it's true that in principle, modulo the constraint that you need to get a periodic charge density out of this, uh, that probably is the hardest constraint in terms of you know breaking things. Again, in the supercell, you have actually a larger degrees of freedom, you know, you have a larger set of degrees of freedom or you have a different set of degrees of freedom if you are not imposing uh, the, the, the symmetries. I don't know, David, what do you think on this? Uh, um, I don't know, it sounds, <clears throat> it sounds unlikely to me, but uh, mm. so, I mean, I guess, um, uh, well, one comment, I, I think if you, if you do, the, the two calculations in a completely parallel way, so that, for example, the k-point sampling that you choose in the supercell uh, maps onto the, uh, you know, in the usual mapping sense, maps onto the same k-point sampling that you're using for the primitive cell calculation, then in principle, and let's say I'm, we're just talking about um, maximal localization of, a, uh, of the occupied states in an insulator for the simpler case, seems to me in principle, the algorithm ought to end up doing exactly the same thing. I mean, actually in the supercell calculations, some of the uh, matrices will be block diagonal, although, uh, um, and, and so on. Um, so um, now it could be that the, that again, that you're actually at a saddle point, not at a minimum, and that there's some instability in which uh, the system can lower its spread by breaking the translational symmetry. Um, I'd be very curious if there is such a case to see it, you know, to see it, uh, you know, somebody find one. I mean, it, it sounds unlikely to me, but I certainly can't think of any uh, a priori reason why it couldn't happen. So it would be interesting if someone can find a clear example where that where that does happen. But I think if I could, I, I don't know if I done the calculations right. You might not have the same number of degrees of freedom because if you have, let's say, in one dimension, a primitive cell uh, with two bands. Uh, and two K points, uh, you have two two by two matrices. But if you double the supercell and keep the consistency on the K points, you have one four by four matrix uh, rather than having a block diagonal. Uh, you know, you have a four by four, but everything is in principle non zero rather than being a two zero zero. So is it correct? I, I think you have more degrees of freedom. Yeah, you have more degrees of freedom. So you yeah. do have the degrees of freedom to break the translational symmetry. Yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah. saying that, you know, I, I think it's it's yeah. analogous to the other kinds of symmetries. Suppose you have some mirror symmetry and you choose projection functions that, you know, make your 1A functions be um, mirror eigenstates, but that's actually a saddle point. And as you run the minimization, you eventually wander off the saddle point and get into some other minimum. Um, so, you know, if the situation is like that, um, that's one plausible scenario. Although, uh, you know, I, uh, as I said, I, <laughs> I find it a priori uh, uh, surprising. So if there is such a situation, I'd like to know. Jamo, do you want to comment on? Yeah, I, may, may I say something? Oh, yeah. Uh. Yeah. Now, what they say, what be interesting in those cases, since the, the maximally localized, they are maximizing the localization of altogether, that is, you are minimizing the spread of the sum of the spreads. 
it may help that you have an instability in the, in the sense that two, two uh, when a function should be equivalent, one is a, has a larger spread and another has a smaller spread. And in, with that, you gain in the total spread. The, the, I think could be, a, 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 let's say, a natural instability coming from the fact that you want to minimize the sum and you can minimize the sum, not taking both equal, but taking yeah. possibly very much different. But you still need to have a periodic charge density that I think is a hard no, I, constraint. No, I missed what you said, Nicole. Sorry, you, you still need to have a periodic charge density that is a hard constraint. Yes. Unless the system yeah. has a true right, right, image. Right, but may happen that you may have a, a, a periodic charge density with two, two uh, functions which are no longer equivalent just because one has a much larger spread and the other one has a much smaller spread. And you sum that to spread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it seems very accidental somehow. Yeah. You know, it could. This actually, and sorry, I let you talk, uh, no, no. reminds me of a question that I'm very fond of, and that is uh, is the dynamics of the uh, centers of charge uh, um, continuous in a molecular dynamic simulation? My, my wild guess would be that it's not, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not aware actually of, uh, never really monitored that. So I, I have a short comment about the super, I have short comment of the supercell thing. So if you have, if you consider a primacy on a supercell, then due to the definition, the finite difference approximation for the spread functional that, that the definition in the original 1997 paper breaks super the size consistency. So even if you use the exact same one-year function and put that in that to equation, it will get different results. So yeah. that might explain yeah. some. Yeah, 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 very good point. Huh? Um, let me make one other point, which is that um, in one dimension, this could not happen, um, right? Because in one dimension, um, you know, you have a non-iterative construction of maximally localized one-a functions and, uh, and you're guaranteed, I think, to get um, 1A functions that are periodic images of one another. So if it cannot happen in one dimension, but it can happen in two dimensions or three dimensions, that also seems to me a little odd. Well, in one dimension, it can happen if you, you know, diagonalize the, you know, if, if you use the procedure from 1D, but if you follow the procedure from the paper uh, and apply it to 1D, it might be that you know, for a finite k-mesh, you somehow run into this problem, right? Because okay. I think the, the claim is that in the finite k-mesh, the way you kind of compute these imaginary part of logarithm causes trouble. Uh, but it's well, kind of I'm, small I'm, numerical. You know. I, I mean, I guess I'm I'm thinking of it in terms of a more abstract question, which is that you know, to, suppose you just ask the question, what are the maximally localized one a functions? Is there ever a situation where the most lo localized Maximally localized one A functions break the periodicity. Yeah, I think I think the question. I, I would think America. not. I, I would be very surprised if the answer is yes. So I, I suspect it's some kind of numerical thing, like the yeah, what like was just discussed. Yes, I think the question was mostly about numerical. So just a side comment, uh, unless I'm mistaken, I have the, the impression that the symmetry, the rotational symmetry problem we were discussing before, is just the alternative view of this discussion here in terms of translational symmetry, isn't it? So somehow, I mean, did it, we should have the same answer to the, to yeah. the two aspects. Maybe a follow-up. Maybe in the case in which there is, there is some degeneracy, uh, maybe this can happen. Maybe I can try to draw because maybe sure. if it's a bit easier, maybe if you take a linear carbon chain and you take p orbitals, right? It's a bit similar to what we were saying before about uh, having some flat region. In principle, you could rotate if you're say pi in the end, pi orbitals on the on the direction of the chain, but you could have the p orbitals, the p x and p y here. You could rotate them, and you could. In the end, they are still uh, the same spread. So I'm just rotating them, and so in principle, in a, in a super, in a unit cell, you have the periodicity. But in a super cell, I guess I don't know. This is a special case because it's flat in a sense. But in a, in a unit cell, you could have you know, here zero ninety, here forty five degrees, 
some other random angle. The Hamiltonian would have, maybe it's what Nicola was saying, would have some half diagonal components. So it's not anywhere unblock repeated. At least in this spatial case, if you want, which is uh, some degeneracy, it, you can have a lot of very equivalent cases in which probably numerically, if you start with, with uh, projections, which are all PX and PY everywhere, the system will not, numerically will not try to go somewhere else, but yeah, yeah. I, I know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so, no, I think it's absolutely correct if they don't talk with each other. Mm -hmm. And if they start talking with each other, uh, it might actually not be the case uh, because they might want uh, to form uh, these bananas uh, that then uh, give rise to. Uh, yes, but still you have, still you have, uh, so the Hamiltonian would be full invariant for rotations. So in principle, you could rotate each of them. But I don't know, maybe it's true. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in this case, if you're, if you're just doing a one-dimensional uh, maximal localization in the in the in the long di dimension, um, you'll get uh, you know one a functions that come in pairs with a degenerate center, and and if they have degenerate centers, then yes, then you can you can rotate those one a functions on each individual unit cell independently, and I don't think there's any crosstalk. So that would be I mean that would be a case where where uh, breaking the periodicity um, doesn't raise the energy, but it like, doesn't raise the spread, doesn't lower the spread, but it also doesn't raise the spread. But you know, another question is, is there really a case where you're really at a saddle point and that by breaking the symmetry, you can lower the spread? And, and that I doubt. Anybody else? At least in 1D. So should we move to uh, another topic? So uh, is it okay if you talk a little bit about this uh, chemical intuition thing? Um, that was, I think, also topic in the summer school. Uh, there's this um, paper from 1984, uh, which has a very nice quote in it. It says that um, the Vanier functions are still one of the most useful but underutilized methodologies of solid state physics. And in particular, it is in the language of Vanier functions that I feel the chemical implications of band theory are most effectively expressed. It's, so this is paper from 1984. Uh, so kind of the question of like, you know, how do we build these, um, this, you know, in the light of this question or, you know, maybe some other problems, like how do we build like, you know, also what Nicola said about, you know, you don't have to minimize R square, maybe you have to minimize something else. Like, is there some way to kind of agree on some kind of descriptors that would be useful? Or maybe there's a way to find kind of descriptors of this chemical intuition, which are gauge invariant, or, you know, we just have to like pick whatever, you know, <laughs> at a certain situation makes no sense. Um, I don't know, uh, or like, what are kind of common descriptors? Do we just look at the Vanya centers? Or is there something that could be gained from, you know, looking at some other operators in the one year presentation, like Hamiltonian or maybe some other operator? All the questions, I don't know how to. Yeah, no, I mean, David, do you want to go first? I have to. Uh, I don't think I have much to say about that one. Why don't, why don't you yeah. take a shot at so, it? So, you know, I think the chemist agonized on this for a long time. So, I, I mean, I mentioned already Foster Boys, Edmondson Rudberg, but also Pipek Meze. So there is actually a very intense literature from the late 60s and the early 70s where exactly chemists think at what is the chemical intuition attached to these chemical bonds and to these localized orbitals. And at the end, it's not that there is a consensus. I mean, there is a uh, if, if anything, uh, you know, the consensus at the time was that the Edmondson Rudenberg was the one that was more, you know, similar to what the chemical intuition that people had built uh, was. And so if you can't do it for molecules uh, in a sort of isolated system, I don't see any other reason why, you know, the solids uh, should be sort of better or easier or different. So this alternative minimization, um, uh, the localization the principle is uh did anybody ever do that for a solid or is that uh, difficult to so 
That's the one with where you minimize self interaction. So, so you maximize, maximize. The, you maximize the self interaction. Huh? No. Okay. Is, so did anybody try that with like K points for solids, um, or would that be useful? I I'm not super sure. You're saying those are bad. Somehow, uh, maybe. I mean, you know, when uh, we do stuff uh, with the Perdue-Zunger functional, so what uh, Hannes Jonsson has been doing. Uh, uh, with the Perdue Zunger functional and what we do with the Koopmans okay, IPZ functional, that gives rise uh, to localized orbitals that are more in the spirit of uh, maximizing the self interaction uh, that is then subtracted. Uh, so, in some ways, that's another you know, localization uh, criterion uh, with the caveat that uh, I think the Perdue Zunger. Uh, so if I remember correctly, if you apply Perdue Zunger to a Gaussian, there is a sort of switch where at certain point you make it less localized things rather than more localized. I've forgotten who, who did this work. I think it's um, Andrea, do you remember the guy? He works with Andy Gorling, uh, Korsdorfer, Thomas Korsdorfer, I think. So, I mean, there, there is some stuff, but uh, I wouldn't over, uh, uh, yeah, of overemphasize it. If anything, uh, we, you know, I've seen a lot of that uh, the, the, the KIPZ localized orbitals that is driven by the Perdue Zunger term in solids look a lot like uh, uh, maximally okay. localized when you function. So, so I, I think the general statement is that all these localization schemes look very similar. Uh, unless they look different, uh, and uh, they look different uh, more in some, you know, small high symmetry molecules. But this is super heuristic. I, you know, okay. I don't know. And you know, in terms of chemical intuition, I think, uh, you know, the uh, something that I really liked. Uh, I mean, David and I are also co-authors, but it was really driven by the, the first effort of Michele Parinello and Pierino Silvestrelli to apply. Bernier functions for chemical intuition. So there is this 1998 uh, solid state communication paper on amorphous silicon, uh, in which uh, you know they took the point of view that I find it very interesting to have, uh, you know, exactly as you describe amorphous or disordered solids uh, with pair correlation functions, rather than having ion ion pair correlation function, uh, they had a Vanier function center ion pair correlation function, and that was actually very insightful to understand uh, because. Uh, you know, one of the conclusions there is that uh, you could have a, a geometrical environment uh, that actually look very similar, but one has a lone pair and one doesn't. Uh, and so this, uh, you know, electronic awareness uh, was actually very interesting. Uh, and there have been, of course, works uh, using uh, Vanier function centers in this respect, uh, but uh, also the symmetrization of the hydrogen bond in high pressure ice and the like. But I always find it quite interesting and maybe underexploited in uh, amorphous solids and liquids and this kind of yeah, systems. Some other comments? No need to be shy. <laughs> okay, so uh, for example, these, uh, all right, let maybe try this uh, SCDM. So, this uh, automated thing that Lin Lin uh, talked about. Do people have understanding for, so it basically works by, you vanierize uh, automatically by, you know, you want five functions and it finds you five, five points in space where you basically put delta function the way I understand it. And then you could use that as initial projections. Is there some kind of understanding for like, how are those points selected? Is there some kind of chemical picture of like what's going on there? Like it's a very mathematical algorithm the way it's represented. It's a QR with pivoting. Yeah. But so, is there some? Yeah. So Giovanni understands it. I okay, never why didn't understood you... <laughs> it. Uh, and that's why we did the projectability disentanglement of which I will comment in a moment. But Giovanni, go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, just I the mask. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if I understand it. I understand the, the first part of the algorithm and then now it continues. Uh, it's harder to explain intuitively. But in the end, you can imagine, so you, you have to construct this density matrix and say the simplest way I have to picture in my head is that you imagine to be in a grid, a real space grid. And so a column would be the, so this, this is a density matrix, is a projector on the valence 
uh, Hilbert space if you're only looking at the valent states. And so every column can be thought as the, the multiplication of this matrix with a vector 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So as you say, it's a delta function in a specific position in space. Yeah. And you can do a lot of projections. And if you do very near, nearby points, you get very similar uh, orbitals, if you want. And by so the properties of uh, short near sight, essentially, they are all localized. And so the, now the question, how you do you get not uh, a million because you have a very dense grid, but you get only a few. And so you do this um, QRCP, which essentially is an algorithm to find the, the few which are most orthogonal. So if you have two which are very close, you don't want to have this. Of course, you pick N of them, so N being the number of any functions, they will most probably anyway span the space, but it will be very you know close together and numerically very unstable. So you want to get the most orthogonal, and then in practice, you also do a load in orthogonalization at the end. The way the algorithm works in practice is that the first one it picks is the one with uh, so how it the largest charge density, I think. The, 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 the maximum. Yeah, so it finds the point with the largest charge density, and that's how it picks the first one. And then from there on, uh, it's more like a finding the most orthogonal mm. one in the rest. Of what you have, and then maybe it's less, at least to me, it's less easy to picture in a sense. But you know, you find one and you find the one with highest density, and then you find the next one, which is the most orthogonal to it, and then you continue like this. And since they are localized, you get a, a basis set, non orthogonal yet, but as orthogonal as possible, if you want. And then, so in this way, the, the idea is that once you do the loading orthogonalization, you remain as close as possible with, without destroying the localization. I don't know if this was clear, but. That's the way I understood it. <laughs> okay. yeah. And then, of course, this one, a gamma or a molecule. Then, if you have uh, K points, it's a bit trickier. I think David said that he has to leave it uh, 445 in our time zone. So um, I can stay for another five or 10 minutes. I, I have another meeting I have to run to. So, so uh, like maybe, so, okay, so there were, so there were, there were questions about, um, like, uh, is there something that could, I don't know who posed this question. Like, is there something that could be gained by having running functions which are not orthonormal? And also, do we really need exponential localization? So I, I don't know who posed that yeah. question. Yeah. But but like for some of the kind of interpolation purposes, um, actually, I think that this paper that I cited, I think the, from Phil Anderson's, he called them let's ultra localized. Uh, yeah. I don't think he, I don't think his are orthonormal. Let, let, let's start with the non ortho maybe again, David. Do you? Um, well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to be gained and also uh, much to be lost. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the uh, non-orthogonal 1A functions can be more localized. Um, and um, there's a huge chemistry literature on using non-orthogonal uh, uh, wave functions as a, a basis set. Um, but then, of course, you lose, uh, you know, uh, all the... Uh, fact that you can relate the 1a functions to each other by unitary rotations they just become generic rotations and, and then you have to keep things balanced in some way um, i guess you make sure that all your uh, 1a functions uh, have unit norm but are not necessarily orthogonal to each other um, but then you know for example the representation of electric polarization in terms of 1a centers is broken um, you know, the change in spread having to do with 1EA centers moving apart from each other is broken. A lot of things get broken. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that's my reaction, um, uh, you know, in terms of actual uh, practical uh, uh, um, experimenting with this idea, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have much experience. So I'm, I'm speaking somewhat from ignorance, but, but that's, that's my, my perspective. <laughs> No, yeah, absolutely. And I think there is also an ill conditioning, if you think at it, uh, because just think uh, sp3 hybrids. Uh, if we were, uh, you know, not forced to be orthogonal, mm. you could have basically an s orbital with infinitesimal amounts uh, of uh, p, and you know that is, you know, exactly any combination. Of SP, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Okay. Uh, so I don't know who posed that question. So I don't know. Somebody wants to comment maybe further? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. You know, I, 
Yeah, I raised the point, but I tend to totally agree with the with the answers in a sense. Okay. I, I also had the feeling that there's uh, not much to gain. Yeah, the question was exactly, is there anything to gain uh, following that path? Maybe before David signs off, uh, it would be interesting to, to hear his thoughts on GMO's question, which I think was, uh, if we are in a situation where there is, for example, a topological obstruction to, make, to exponential localized vanity functions, uh, and they are just polynomially localized, is that still good enough to use them for numerical work? Did you have in mind like interpolation or? Okay, he's nodding, so I think he's kind of agreeing, but maybe you can elaborate. Uh, uh, is that a question to me? Uh, yes. um, well, let me comment. Um, so, uh, I don't think so, is my short answer. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, when you have a topological obstruction, it means that the gauge uh, has to have a, uh, there's a point in case space where there's basically a vortex present. And, um, and first of all, you know, that will give you power law tails that makes it, I think, impossible to, cut, to, to define uh, position matrix elements. Um, and then secondly, um, the location of that vortex in K space is completely arbitrary. By changing the gauge, you can move it around. And um, so it just sounds to me like a, a, a rather unpleasant way to proceed. Uh, that's my reaction, but I, you know, I've never tried it. I, I have a comment on that. That is, if even if the localization is not exponential, when you write the inverse transformation, you get a periodic gauge. So, so uh, I think this is by absurdum you, you can prove that. That is, suppose I have a topological material. If I can find orthonormal when a function, no matter how localized they are, I write the inverse transformation and I find that the block states uh, fulfill a periodic gauge, which cannot be. It, it can be if there's a if, if there's a singularity in the gauge, right? In other words, uh, yeah, you but, know, but, like I say, a vortex. Basically, uh, there's a point in the gauge where an infinitesimal circle around the gauge gives you two pi. Um, uh, you know, you can you can soak up the uh, the very uh, you know you can soak up the churn number by putting the vortex in instead of by having the uh, gauge be not be uh, non periodic, but but it seems to me that if you write the inverse transformation, that is, you write from a one year function to the block, then the block is a, a, an elite is a periodic, is a periodic gauge for any k. Yeah, but if you start with one a functions that have these horrible power law tails and then do the one a, uh, you know, the inverse transformation. Because they're so poorly uh, localized in real space, you get a singularity in case. Yeah, yeah, it can be non convergent in some sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I see. I, I would say it's also important to distinguish between uh, the topological side and the metal side, because when we disentangle, uh, we have actually something that is basically exponentially localized, uh, exactly because it's smooth. I mean, in some ways that, you know, forgets uh, the discontinuities. Has anyone tried uh, to localize a topological material? Because, uh, you know, being an engineer also, you know, <laughs> algebraic and exponential, are more or less the same. So. I think actually yeah. when SCDM yeah. was started, yeah. I, I had a conversation with Lunen. He, there is a paper by David and uh, Tonhauser on the Aldane model where it is very clear that the overlap matrix, so okay. you cannot invert it anymore. No, okay. So. Oh, that's a fantastic reference. The 2010, uh, is David still there? Okay, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's basically the top of, that's, yeah, that's, a, that, that's related to this topological obstruction that we've just been discussing. There were papers, um, um, I'm, I'm not gonna remember who, but for, for metals, uh, there were papers where um, uh, people constructed a, uh, um, a kind of a, a scaling, um, renormalization group type of uh, structure where you have 
most of your 1A functions are very localized, and then you have a few that have a larger distance, and then a few that are very delocalized. And as you get close to the Fermi level, you have a you know a very small fraction of 1A functions that are extremely delocalized. It, it might yeah. have been Roy Bayer, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. That sounds right. But I mean, I think in metals, the issue is that you want to localize a broader manifold. So that's the issue. I mean, of course, if you want just to represent the occupied states, you have exactly what you described. But the interesting thing to do is just localize the, a disentangled manifold that includes also the conduction. Yeah, I think I remember when, when I talked to Lin Lin that he took a finite Haldane model, applied the SCDM, and then most of them were localized, and some of them had like this. Yeah long tails but there is i mean you have you know the representation of the fermi operator on the disentangled so there is no need to just transform the occupy exactly ones. exactly exactly okay i do have to leave any final question for me <laughs> maybe maybe a slightly related question is what about this fragile topology why you can't banyarize those bands that have this fragile topology but the, you know, the, the overall chair number is still zero, but... Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, again, it, I think that um, is always embedded in questions of symmetry. I think it's always questions about whether you can... Um, uh, I mean, if you're willing to break symmetry in the, in the generation of 1A functions, um, I think um, those problems... Uh, uh, you know, I think the fragile fragile topology is defined in the context of certain symmetry con constraints, and um, um, because you need to reproduce the symmetry representations at high symmetry points in the Brillouin zone in a certain way. Um, I don't think I better say any more right now because I'll just <laughs> I, I'm not uh, up on this enough uh, to have a, a, a clear uh, a, a clear picture in my head at the moment. But but that's my first reaction. Thank you, David, for your time. Thank you. This was fun. And I hope you're still there. <laughs> Bye. Any questions to wrap up or? I didn't get a chance to ask David if he had any regrets. So, but, uh... <laughs> well, he can tell us some things. Yeah. Don't. Um, Anyone? So for example, like, like okay, so this, um, when people, there was a lot of talk about electron phonon, right? So, you know, you use Vanier functions, you take this operator, and then you can compute whatever you want with however many K and Q points you want. It's very useful. If you kind of think more broadly, are there some other solid state calculations where you would gain from vanierizing, for example, like beta cell Peter or GW are kind of expensive calculations. Yeah. Okay, in GW you can get away usually just with shifting bands because GW doesn't change orbitals too much. But let's say you want to you, you do beta cell Peter for example, something else on like a coarse mesh, and then you vanierize it somehow. Like, would it in pro in principle be possible to kind of vanierize everything, or maybe there are some things that you can't, or maybe you can think of something else. Or I mean, I, I is there think, some other operator you could you know, also vanierize? You or? know, I think anything that depends, uh, you know, completely on the Fermi surface, uh, on states at the Fermi surface, uh, really benefits uh, from vanierization when you have to do this, you know, integrals to capture the response from a line of states or anything. Actually. Uh, we, we, you know, very early on, uh, we had a project uh, with um, uh, Mayul Dazak and Francesco Mauri on NMR in metals. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we needed to calculate the spin susceptibility, the orbital susceptibility, and the night shifts. Uh, and those were uh, horrendous uh, sort of uh, integrals to converge because exactly they, they, uh, they require that response. So, I mean, in general, I think uh, anything that uh, requires uh, exactly a low dimensional manifold with respect uh, to your entire Brillouin zone will, will need a lot of K points uh, to be calculated precisely. And then when the decision is good. Uh, so for example, there's a PRL from Louis Group on um, uh, beta cell Peter, I think molybdenum disulfide. I think where they 
to get the spectrum of X points correct, they need to, I think effectively had to do like a 700 by 700 K point grid. And, you know, that's like a, and they had some tricks to do it, but, you know, um, uh, if there's a way to kind of speed up those, or maybe, you know, there's some other code, you know, something else that people compute that could be sped up. Um, I don't know if people have some. Yes. Yeah, I think that concerning Bethesda Peter, there were some early attempts of using Vanier functions uh, by Claudia Takalite mm. and um, a few other people, but uh, early, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is still something that could be further explored in a sense, because uh, you typically need a few bands. So it's okay, you also involve empty states, but typically those are a few uh, just for the lowest line parts of the spectrum, but you have an incredible number of key points. So somehow the shape of the beta cell Peter matrix should look pretty differently once on the K basis, uh, other than the Vanier space. So, uh, I, think there's room, I think there's room for, for improvement. Pa Paolo Omari has been doing a lot of, you know, the GWL code, the GW, the beta cell Peter, all in a Vanier basis or a yeah, combination of Vanier functions. So, yeah. I mean, others, I suppose. We should buy it as ever. But, but what, yeah, but whenever <laughs> you need empty states, uh, so they say GW, I mean, that's where plain waves shine because all these localized basis, let's say, let's put aside any function, let's say, because like CS and everything, they, the, the basis set is not complete. So you cannot go, you cannot converge actually. Mm. So right. maybe what the right thing to do is to rewrite things in terms of the occupy states only. Yeah. So people like Sternai doing Sternai equations, they're, that, that makes sense because you have the occupied states only and, and you can work in a localized basis. But yeah, so we have know, with the empty states, uh, I, I don't think it's a good idea to go but, with functions. Yeah, so basically in Cholhan Stonk, there was a, you kind of basically vanierize Sternheimer equation in the FPT in some sense. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, but I, I haven't thought deep about that aspect. But normally the bottleneck for solving butter cell purification is to diagonalize uh, the K space that they all couple to each other. So mm. even if you obtain somehow um, those uh, huge matrix in K space, like several thousand by thousand, it's not, it, it was uh, difficult to diagonalize them. So there is that problem. Oh, I see. So normally that's the, the difficult part for when it comes to the accident physics. I don't know whether there is a way that one can do entirely localized uh, moment, uh, sorry, real space thing. But, um... That's because exciton is made of all the transitions together and then somehow I see. So I have two, two comments about this. So for for PSC thing, I have very I have little experience. I, I have no experience with PSC, but maybe iterative dialogue methods might be my solve the problem to mentioned if you can represent the Hamiltonian in some localized spaces, so in a sparse manner. And regarding the previous topic about the empty states, so as Sinisha mentioned, the, our work on linear function perturbation theory is a way to solve the problem of empty states in in case of perturbative calculations. So you can represent the wave function perturbation, which includes a lot of empty bands, but in a localized manner. So it's not applicable to all problems, but it might solve some problems. For example, the self-energy, real part of the self-energy, which we calculated in our paper. Okay, good. Uh, so when are we doing this meeting again? <laughs> Next year? <laughs> I, well, the developers meeting from what I've seen uh, that is very little since I've been very successful in bringing yeah. together. So uh, it's not for me to say, but I, I thought there was a lot of enthusiasm of uh, making this a more regular event uh, because uh, I think it really brings people you know, together to think and do problems. and. Uh, and it's very easy to get bits of funding from everywhere. So actually yeah. funding is not a problem. And uh, it's actually maybe, you know, this is a general comment uh, that uh, uh, in some ways, uh, 
I mean, I think Xavier Gonza said it uh, very early on. I mean, Xavier both said that, you know, biodiversity of codes uh, when referring to electronic structure codes uh, is a very positive thing. So, but very early on, actually used the, you know, case of Vanier 90 as a very interesting effort that was actually sort of, you know, working with all these different, uh, different communities. And, uh, you know, I've always been convinced that, uh, you know, software and simulation software is really, you know, one of the powerful pillars of 21st century science. And I think this is one of probably the nicest examples. So where we exactly bring together very different communities, pieces, people with different interests and different codes. So because again, you know, biodiversity is important, but, uh, you know, we have the long view that I think is, is good to develop uh, you know, a powerful environment. Uh, so so I, I see this as a very interesting, very successful and also very pleasant example. And, uh, you know, probably we should do our best as we are, and as you guys are doing. I don't do anything these days uh, apart from writing grants, uh, basically. Uh, but I, I think you should really continue because it's such a nice example of how to do science and computational science uh, this century without somehow the stress that uh, some other communities have, I think. Uh, maybe, you know, yeah, just I think because, it, yeah. I think it was good to have kind of people who kind of go in depth, yeah. who understand the code very well, and are, we're discussing a lot of like technical things that are, you know, useful for kind of us who kind of use this more than develop, but then uh, also kind of have the breadth with people who kind of came from wide range of things where areas where they kind of use some of these funny related ideas. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of diversity, I think also the idea that, you know, you know, maybe there are people who are kind of more in a like coding side or more in like development side. I think that's uh, good to have a kind of that, that, that uh, mix. Okay, until next time, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. So, yeah. thank you, thanks everyone. We still meet tomorrow, so I think it's nine. We get summaries of all the kind of things that were achieved during the meeting at night.